welcome the next speaker on stage. Here in here, J.F. Ilraka, Senior Software Engineer, Google. congratulating GDG Sri Lanka for 10 years of amazing work. Uh, and I should also say that I'm, uh, I've spoken at a number of Google events, Google I.O., Cloud Next, and numerous GDG events around the world. And this right here is probably one of the coolest venues I've ever spoken at. So amazing job, guys. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk to you a little bit about one of my favorite topics, the cloud. The cloud, as we know, has taken the industry by storm. It has changed the way companies think about running their IT operations. It has changed the way developers think about implementing systems and apps. However, despite this exponential growth of the cloud, many people still don't fully understand how it all works, and more importantly, what it takes to build and operate a cloud platform at scale. So in this talk, I'm, I expect to shed, a light, shed some light on some of these low-level nitty-gritties of the cloud and, and some of the amazing technology that makes the cloud work the way it does. But let's start with a simple and rather fundamental question. What exactly is the cloud? Now, interestingly, there's no singular, universally accepted definition for what the cloud is. Depending on the books or the papers you refer to, you are likely to come up with slightly different answers. However, all these different definitions and explanations you will find, they will generally agree on the characteristics a system should have for it to qualify as a cloud computing system. And you probably already heard of these characteristics. They include things like having a pool of resources, being remotely accessible and being able to access those, uh, those resources on demand and just pay for what you use. As we list these different characteristics, we can see an increasingly clearer picture of the cloud taking form in our heads. But for today's talk, I want to brush all that aside and adopt a slightly different definition of what the cloud is. I personally first heard this definition about six, seven years ago, and it's had a profound effect on, on how I personally view the cloud. Hopefully, you will feel the same way. So here goes. We all use mobile apps and web apps, right? Pretty much every day on a wide range of devices. However, these devices are often short of resources, and therefore, the apps running on them have to offload their computing and storage needs to something else. This definition simply says that something is the cloud. Now, why do I like this definition? There are a couple of reasons. First, it's mind-numbingly simple, so much so that even a non-technical person can really understand it. But perhaps more importantly, it also puts a spotlight on this often overlooked relationship between, between apps and the cloud. In fact, according to this definition, the cloud primarily exists to serve mobile apps and web apps. Now, this might sound a little radical at first, but it's not really, especially if you look at the, the, the explosive growth that we've seen in cloud and the mobile spaces in the last 10 years. The growth in mobile and cloud have often gone hand in hand each benefiting from the other. Now, I want you to keep this definition in mind as we go through the rest of this talk. We will circle back to it towards the end and make an interesting point. But for now, let's start further dissecting this thing that we call the cloud. Like most computing systems, the cloud 
also can be broken down into several layers. So you have your hardware, the network stack, and various control software that make all of that work. But in case of cloud, there are also the high-level services and APIs that end users and developers would interact with it. Let's start with the hardware. Cloud platforms are made of data centers. These are basically buildings that house various computing and network equipment. And as far as buildings go, they don't look all that remarkable. Like They look like any other random industrial building, like this Google data center from Oklahoma. And here's another data center from Netherlands. Here we see a, a, a vehicle parked there at the bottom, uh, bottom right uh, next to the data center. That sort of gives you an idea how, how large this facility is. And here's another Google data center from Belgium. What you're seeing here is the steam coming off some cooling towers, and they just put some Google-themed lighting behind it for dramatic effect, kind of like this venue. And here's a data center that's somewhat close to you in Singapore. So if you are using any Google services from Sri Lanka, there's a pretty good chance at least some of your data is stored in a server in that building. And inside the data center, you will likely to find rows and rows of server racks like this. This is a data center from Georgia. That's the US state, not the country. And here's another view. Uh, this is from Belgium. Here you see thousands of uh, indicator lights flickering away to indicate power, network connectivity, and various other things. And here's an overhead view of a Google data center from Iowa. Here you can really see the scale of this facility coming into perspective. But here we can see, notice something else. See, look at all the plumbing that, and the pipes that are crisscrossing the data center. That's even more prominent in this diagram, which is from the same Georgia data center that we looked at like a couple of slides ago, but just a different part of the same facility. These pipings, they are to basically help cool the data center. The pipes are actually painted with Google-themed colors, but that also serves as a color coding scheme so the engineers can tell which pipe is which. For example, the green pipes are called the chillers. The pink pipes carry Google the, the chiller the hot water in the chillers to the cooling towers outside, and so on. So if it's not already obvious, this is a water-cooled data center. The principle of water cooling is actually quite simple. You put some cold water tanks just outside the data center, and then you build an elaborate network of pipes to carry that water to the data center. The water absorbs the heat from the equipment and becomes hot. The hot water is then channeled through a series of cooling towers where they dissipate the heat and become cold again so they can be used for another cycle. So very simple but also rather effective way to cool a data center. But you can actually be clever about how you implement this and make it even more efficient. Take this data center in Finland, for example. This is a pretty remarkable setup for a couple of reasons. First, Google didn't build this facility. It used to be an old paper mill that Google acquired. So it came with all these tanks and plumbing built in, and Google just repurposed them uh, to serve the needs of a data center. And secondly, as you can see, this data center is right next to the Gulf of Finland. So it is able to pull ice-cold, frigid water directly from the Gulf, which is underneath that sheet of ice, and use that cold water to cool this facility. And this clever use of natural conditions make this one of the most power efficient or energy efficient data centers in Google's fleet. Data centers can also be air cooled. What you're seeing here is the cold air intake system of our Ireland data center. It's not, it might not be clear how air cooling actually works from this diagram, so let me explain that with a schematic. In an air cooled data center, the, the aisles between server racks are designated either cold aisles or hot aisles. And in the, uh, at the bottom of the cold aisles are these ventilation, uh, ventilation gaps that pump cold air into the data center. And the server cabinets have ventilation equipment that absorbs the cold air where a heat exchange takes place, and the resulting hot air gets dumped into a hot aisle. 
However, the hot air is lighter, so its natural tendency is to rise up. You might uh, remember that from your high school physics class, the science class. And so at the ceiling of the hot oil, you have some collection device which collects the hot air and then channels it through a series of cooling devices so it can be recycled. Data centers also have some rather unique power requirements. So you are likely to see a ton of power distribution and regulation equipment like this in them. Also, data centers tend to draw power from uh, multiple power grids. Usually in a city, the, the power grid is actually made of multiple subgrids that can fail independently. That's why it's possible for you to experience a power outage at your home while your neighbor just a couple of, a couple of blocks away uh, has, has, has power and everything looks good because you, are, you and your neighbor happen to be on two different grids. So a data center would physically connect to multiple such grids, so they have redundancy. If one grid goes down, the data center still remains up. Some data centers are also strategically located near alternative power sources. This is the Belgium data center. As you can see, it's right next to a huge array of solar panels. We saw the, the Netherlands data center earlier. Yeah, they, they had a giant wind turbine in the background. However, all these different power sources are subject to failure, so you should also have some backup generators on standby. The generators like this can keep a data center alive indefinitely as long as you keep refueling them. However, in the event of a catastrophic power failure, it could take a few minutes for the generators to kick in. So you need a mechanism to keep the data center alive for that short duration. For that, many data centers use a setup like this, basically a room full of giant car batteries. It's a UPS for the entire data, data center. A rig like this can keep the data center alive for about five to 10 minutes, which is just enough time for the generators to kick in. And if they don't kick in, which can also happen, this at least gives a small window for the administrators to initiate a graceful shutdown of all the servers. Now, how do you measure the power or the energy efficiency of all this? There are several metrics we can use, but perhaps the most widely used, or perhaps the most popular metric is called PUE, the power usage effectiveness. It's simply the, the ratio between the total energy intake of the data center and the energy spent on the IT equipment. Now, ideally, we want the total energy equipment, uh, the total energy intake to be spent on the IT equipment in which case this ratio will be one. But in reality, you had to also spend energy on things like cooling, so the total energy intake ends up being higher, which means the, the actual PUE is higher than one. Now about uh, 10 years ago, a PUE around two was considered good. That used to be the gold standard. But in 2008, Google made a breakthrough by reaching 1.21, Microsoft reached 1.22 around the same time, but the technology has been improving ever since, and these days, cloud providers report values as low as 1.02, so it's very energy efficient. Now let's talk a little bit about the server hardware, the IT equipment themselves. So what you see here is a close-up of a server rack. As you can see, all the equipment is just exposed. There's no effort has been made to put them in any, in any kind of housings. That just makes it easier to do maintenance. The administrators can just pull uh, failed components out and replace them with uh, new components. Now, when you look at, a, look at a picture like this, it might remind you of these old uh, server rooms that many organizations and universities used to have. In fact, a lot of them still do, the private uh, server rooms. So how does data center hardware compared to those traditional private server room hardware. Now, in a typical private server room, you are likely to find a couple of dozen servers. And usually, they are the best and most expensive equipment the money could buy. They are designed to last for a long time, and, and they usually come with very long warranties, sometimes decades long. In contrast, 
a data center is comprised of thousands of servers. Even a small data center is likely to have around 5,000 servers. But unlike on-premise server rooms, data center hardware is the absolute cheapest equipment you can buy. In fact, a lot of the time, they are so cheap, you can't actually buy them at a regular store. Nobody really sells them at retail. Instead, they are usually custom made in bulk using low-grade silicon. The downside of this, so the upside is it makes the cloud more economical. To be able to operate a such a large fleet of machines, each machine, individual machine, needs to be very cheap. The downside is that data center hardware are quite unreliable, and they tend to fail all the time. In year 2003, Google famously published a paper on their distributed file system. In this paper, authors made a comment about perils of running software on data center hardware. It goes something like this. Component failures are the norm rather than the exception. The quantity and quality of the components virtually guarantee that some are not functional at any given time, and some will not recover from their current failures. Therefore, constant monitoring, error detection, fault tolerance, and automatic recovery must be integral to the system. I think that sums it up much better than I could. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that one day you are going to wake up and find all your cloud apps and your data are gone because something failed. No. In fact, cloud providers like Google implement all that stuff, error detection, automatic recovery, to mask these failures from end users and the developers. Nevertheless, it's something to keep in mind. You have to assume that things can fail catastrophically, impacting your systems. And you need to have the right level of redundancy to deal with that. What does that mean? This is Google Cloud's global presence map. Each marker is what we call a cloud region. A region contains one or more data centers. Solid blue markers are the regions that are already operative. White markers are planned expansions. Each region is also comprised of smaller sub-regions. Let's call them availability zones. Those, that's the, the numbers in each markers represent the number of availability zones in each region. These availability zones are set up so they can fail independently. So when there's a power outage or a network outage, it doesn't knock out the entire region. It usually knocks out one or two availability zones. So if you're running some applications in the cloud, and if you're solely operating from a single region, it's a good idea to replicate your data and services across multiple availability zones. But sometimes, even that's not enough. Region-wide outages are rare, but not impossible. Usually, that happens due to na things like natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes. So if you wish to deal with that kind of situations, you need to go one level further and also replicate your data and services across regions. Now, some cloud services have this capability built in. It's highly recommended you use those services whenever possible, because implementing geo-replication is a very hard problem and has serious performance implications. Now, not all the server equipment you find in a data center are cheap and unreliable. There are also some really cool and unique so uh, specialized hardware in the mix, too. Take this little device, for example. It's called a Tensor Processing Unit, or a TPU, designed and developed by Google, especially for our data centers. It's essentially a processor that is optimized for vector operations that are very common among machine learning applications. This device heats up a lot, so they put in those little copper tubes so they could inject water directly into the processor housing and cool it from the inside. This, of course, looks very large on the this, on this screen, but it's about the same size as a commercial graphics card, which means those tubes are very narrow. So we have to make sure the water that's fed to this device is absolutely pure and has the exact pH value we need. If the water contains any impurities, it's going to clog the tubes over time. So Google combines TPUs like this to build TPU pods. A pod like this can has about 100 uh, 100 plus petaflops of compute power. That's, if you don't know what petaflops is, let's just say that's about the same compute power as a, as a high-end supercomputer. So Google offers these 
TPU pods as a cloud service, so developers like you can run your AI and machine learning applications in the cloud and just pay for your usage. The benefit you get is that TPU pods are significantly faster and costs less when you actually use and pay for it by the minute. In fact, we've done benchmarks where a neural network that took around three and a half hours to train on a cluster of high-end NVIDIA GPU clusters took only eight minutes to train when processed on a, G on a TPU pod. Some of the other specialized hardware you are likely to find may not be server hardware at all. What you see here is a rack in a data center, but instead of servers, it's set up with mobile devices. This is actually part of a product offering that my team operates called Firebase Test Lab. Test Lab allows mobile app developers to upload their apps to the cloud along with a test suite. We will then, or rather Test Lab, will then deploy your app to a rig like this and run your test on a wide range of devices. Each of these devices are from different vendors. They run different versions of Android and iOS. So at the end, you get a comprehensive test report indicating how your code, how your app did in each of these different environments. OK, that's all I wanted to say about cloud platform hardware. Next, let's talk a little bit about the network stack of data centers. Most data center networks are set up according to the so-called factory topology shown here. In this rather simplified diagram, each server connects to an edge switch that, sits on, that usually sits on top of the, of, of the rack, which connects to at least two aggregate switches, which connects to at least two core switches. So those redundant connections in the middle layers make sure there are multiple redundant paths between individual servers. So in this diagram, if you pick any two servers from the lowest layer, you will find four communication paths. That's two squared between them. Despite the resources available in a data center, they also have to deal with several unique problems that you won't find anywhere else. The hotspotting problem is one such situation. This is a network traffic intensity heat map. Each pixel, each little square, indicates the level of traffic between some pair of server racks. We can see that most of the space is either white or yellow, meaning there's not a lot of traffic between most server racks. But we also see some real dark spots here and there. So those are the hot spots. So those are that's intense communication between some of, or, or few server racks. The problem with hot spots is that they are extremely unpredictable. They tend to jump around as the workload of the data center changes. And when they do occur, they can absolutely overwhelm the communication paths between those server racks, which affects the latency of your applications. So over the years, researchers have come up with all kinds of clever and fascinating solutions to deal with problems like this. Here's one such solution, which was actually developed at my university when I was a grad student. So in this case, researchers basically put a high-frequency wireless antenna on top of each server rack. Each of these antennas were also fitted with a control device so they could remotely control it and, and just point it towards any direction. <clears throat> they then built some monitoring software to track the traffic hotspots in the data center in real time. And this software would signal, uh, when it detects a hotspot, it would signal the corresponding antennas to align and form a temporary wireless connection. This temporary connection increases the bandwidth between those two server racks, which helps mitigate the congestion. However, there's a problem. The wireless antennas operate at 60 gigahertz. Turns out at that frequency range, you ne actually need direct line of sight between antennas for them to be able to establish a connection. But we saw what data centers are like earlier. There's a lot of plumbing and a lot of equipment hanging from the ceiling, so it's not always possible to establish direct line of sight. So to work around that, they basically put some reflective material on the ceiling of the data center, just some cheap aluminum foil, and use that to bounce the signal off, uh, off the ceiling and establish the wireless connections. Some data centers make even more radical optimizations to their network stack, like modifying protocols like TCP. The basic TCP protocol has a mechanism to signal the hosts when the congestion is about to occur. 
This is called ECN, Explicit Congestion Notification. However, this is only a binary feedback. It just tells whether congestion is about to occur or not. Data Center TCP modifies this ECN mechanism so that it not only tells the host that congestion is building up, but also how much congestion that we can possibly expect. This allows hosts to make smarter and better congestion control decisions, and turns out when you implement it in a data center, it results in the same or better throughput as normal TCP, but using only but using 90% less buffer space on network equipment. And that results in less congestion, low latency, and high tolerance for bursts of traffic. OK, now let's go a little bit beyond the data center networks and look at the global picture. This is Google Cloud's global network configuration. Each dot is a data center, or a region, roughly speaking. And the lines are either underground or submarine cables connecting them. Green lines are that are uh, currently ongoing uh, ongoing work. This is a slightly outdated diagram. For example, the line called Kiri, which connects the US West Coast to South America, actually went online just about a week ago. You may have seen, seen it on news, uh, on international news. So over the last two decades, Google has built one of the world's largest, glo uh, largest networks. And according to what I could find, Google owns over 100,000 kilometers of submarine cables internationally. To manage all this, we use a system called B4. It's a software-defined networking system. Now, traditionally, SDNs are usually used to manage local or organizational networks. So this makes B4 already one of the largest SDN deployments in the world. And it's really composed of three components. First, you have some custom switch hardware that operates at each networking site. So this, this, uh, this is what that device looks like, was built by Google. And that's actually a server that's running Linux and an OpenFlow agent. If you're not familiar, OpenFlow is a widely used SDN protocol. Then we have some site controllers that manage traffic within sites. So when I say site, think region. It's not, I'm not referring to websites. So site controllers run the OpenFlow control software. So that's the other part of the OpenFlow protocol. Site controllers make local routing decisions and instruct the switchers on how they should forward packets. Finally, B4 has a central traffic engineering server that looks at the entire global network and decides how to route traffic globally. This is implemented as a traditional server application. It's implemented in C++. It monitors the bandwidth usage in different parts of this global network and signals the site controllers around the world to keep the traffic moving. Collectively, B4 runs an algorithm called max-min fare allocation. That's how, we, that's how B4 decides how much bandwidth to allocate to each application running in our data centers. This algorithm is frugal in the sense that it doesn't give any application more bandwidth than is needed, and it's also fair, meaning if some applications end up not getting their required share of the bandwidth, it will make sure that they all get uh, an equal share of the free bandwidth available. Now, this solution actually works, in, works great in practice. Uh, it turns out B4 can uh, drive the utilization of our global network links to 100% and sustain it over time. And the other advantage of B4 is that because most of it is implemented in software, we can roll out updates and, and patches more easily without having to mess with the hardware. In other words, we can update our network control plane the same way we update things like Android and Chrome. Speaking of software, now let's talk a little bit about some of the other critical software systems that we use to operate our cloud. Google File System is our fault-tolerant distributed file system. It allows the applications running in our data centers to, re to be able to read and write files without being affected by the flakiness of the hardware. Now, GFS was initially designed for batch processing applications that deal with really large files. To better serve these applications, GFS divides each file to 64 megabyte chunks, 
and then each of these chunks get independently replicated to at least three chunk servers. This replication ensures that even if some chunk servers are down, applications can still access any file since GFS can probably find enough live replicas to construct the original file. GFS has a single centralized master server that manages all the chunk servers. It also keeps metadata and state about our file system at runtime. In the event of a master failure, we can stand up a new master server within seconds. The master also decides where each chunk replica is placed. Generally, it tries to be smart about this and tries to put replicas on different physical servers, sometimes on different racks for high availability. Now, a distributed file system is a good start, but how often do we implement programs that directly read and write files, right? What we typically need in practical sense is a way to store structured data and be able to query it. So we need some sort of a database that runs on this infrastructure. To meet this requirement, Google built a system called Bigtable. Bigtable, it's, it, it's a massively scalable NoSQL database that runs on top of our distributed file system. A Bigtable database can have billions of rows. And each row can have thousands of columns. And you can also add columns as you go. You don't have to define a fixed schema ahead of time like with relational databases. Each cell in Bigtable database can store multiple versions of data. Like in this diagram, we can see the, first, the very first cell has three versions of some HTML text. So when querying, we can ask for data by the row ID, column ID, and the version to, to get to the data that we need. <clears throat> Architecturally, Bigtable also have a single centralized server, master server, and a set of workers that we call tablet servers. A tablet is just a partition of the, of the bigger database, consisting of some number, some range of rows. Now, as the database grows, Bigtable splits it into smaller and smaller tablets and hands them off to different tablet servers to balance the load. Now, the nice thing about this design is that it really scales with the number of servers in operation. You can, uh, if a database becomes very popular and, and needs to handle more load, we can just commit more servers to that cluster to, incre to increase its performance. However, there are, there are several limitations in this design as well. For instance, it doesn't support join queries, so you can't join multiple databases when querying uh, a data set. It also doesn't support multi-row transactions, meaning you can only update one row in a given operation. And perhaps the biggest problem, it only supports eventual consistency when operating across regions. What that means is if you update a piece of data in one region, a user in another region can still read the old value. It will take a while for the write to propagate to all the different regions. Now, when you are implementing complex distributed applications, limitations like this can, can make your life really miserable. So to make things a little easier, Google built another database product called Spanner. Spanner is our globally distributed relational database. It supports SQL, which, which, may, which many developers like. Bigtable also, uh, sorry, Spanner supports high performance transactions across rows and regions, meaning a Spanner transaction can atomically update multiple rows while touching data in different regions. And it provides something called external consistency. So this is the highest level of uh, consistency a distributed database can theoretically provide. In external consistency, all the transactions appear as if they have been executed sequentially in order. Now, of course, in reality, they are executed in, uh, they are executed in parallel, concurrently, in, in different regions. But Spanner can give you this illusion of concurrent execution. To provide external consistency, Spanner uses a feature called TrueTime. It's a mechanism that assigns monotonically increasing timestamps to each new transaction. That's basically how Spanner is able to order those transactions in its history. Now, it turns out this is actually a very difficult problem to solve in practice. 
you need an extremely precise global timekeeping mechanism for this to even be feasible. Your typical internet-based clock synchronization is not good enough. So to solve this problem, Google actually uses two kinds of specialized hardware. The first kind is called GPS masters. These are timekeeping servers equipped with GPS receivers. So the GPS satellites in orbit con continuously transmit precise time information. So these servers are designed to receive that broadcast and, and set their internal clocks accordingly. The second type of hardware is really there for redundancy. They're called Armageddon masters, and they are directly fitted with atomic clocks for precise timekeeping. Now, I understand this sounds very extreme, uh, but that's basically what it takes to provide external consistency at this scale. And the last system we are going to talk about is Borg, which is our cluster management system. Borg is basically responsible for running, scheduling, and managing every single service that Google offers. That includes various batch tasks that we run internally, things think uh, retraining our page ranks, uh, or rather recalculating our page ranks for Google Search, or other long-running public services things like the web servers that receive your Google Search or Gmail traffic. Borg is designed to make resource management and fault handling easier. When we want to run a new service in a data center, we just provide our application binary to Borg along with a little configuration file, and Borg takes care of the rest. The configuration file specifies things like how much CPU and memory to assign to our job, how many copies of it should be run, that kind of things. So how does it work? Borg divides our server fleet into these units called cells. A cell can have several hundred or several thousand servers. Each of these servers run an agent process called the Borglet. They keep track of how much resources are in, in their server and what tasks are currently running in them. And each cell also has a number of Borg master servers. When a task is dispatched to a cell, the master coordinates with the Borglets to figure out how to deploy and run the task on the available servers. It will also keep track of the running tasks, and if something fails, the affected task get automatically respawned somewhere else in the cell. Now, this seemingly simple architecture has proven to be extremely scalable. In a 2015 paper published by Google, authors wrote this. We are not sure where the ultimate scalability limit to Borg's centralized architecture will come from. So far, every time we've approached the limit, we've managed to eliminate it. A single Borg master can manage many thousands of machines in a cell, and several cells have arrival rates about 10,000 tasks per minute. Now, that's really just an academic way of saying we don't know what the limits of Borg are, but it works, so we don't care. OK, so now that was a metric ton of information. I do not expect you to remember all that, but let me try to condense it down to a single picture. We started our deep dive on data with data center hardware. We talked about the unreliable servers, the cooling and power requirements, and some of the specialized hardware like TPUs. Then we looked at the data center network stack. We talked about the factory topology, various optimizations like wireless bandwidth augmentation and data center TCP. And we also talked about B4, Google's uh, global SDN. Then we looked at some of the critical software systems that powered the Google Cloud. We talked about our distributed file system, GFS, our key value store, Bigtable, our relational database, Spanner, and our cluster management system, Borg. Now, this is not by any means a complete picture, but it's a pretty decent representation of what it takes to build and operate a cloud platform at planetary scale. Now, as external users or developers, you don't interact with these things directly. Typically, the cloud provider builds a set of high-level services which you use to develop your, your own systems and applications. Now, in case of Google Cloud Platform, this high-level services layer is quite extensive. There are literally hundreds of things that you can be using. Here you will find your typical infrastructure services like Compute Engine and, uh, and Cloud Storage, and then you have your runtime services like App Engine, Cloud Run, and Cloud Functions. And then you have things that are optimized for various specific domains like Internet of Things, AI, uh, data analytics. Now, incidentally, this is also where we 
come full circle and uh, to where we started this talk. Remember our simpler definition of the cloud? It says the cloud basically exists to serve mobile and web apps. Now, this is something Google Cloud takes very seriously. Google Cloud strives to make it easy for developers to mo develop mobile apps and web apps using our cloud. To that end, we provide a set of services that we collectively refer to as Firebase, which is the team that I work on. So Firebase is Google's app development platform. It comes with roughly three different types of products. We provide things that can help you develop feature-rich apps easily and quickly. Then we provide things that can help you improve the quality of your apps by testing them and, and measuring their performance. And thirdly, we provide things that can help you engage and grow your user base by sending push notifications and analyzing usage patterns. All these products are backed by Google Cloud. So when you use Firebase, you actually benefit from the scale and the power the Google Cloud has to offer. Now here's an example Android app that one of my teammates made. It's a universal translator of sort. You can speak to it in a number of languages, and then it will try to translate your speech into a bunch of different languages and, and print it on the screen. You can find the code at that GitHub, GitHub uh, repo. You can even try to build and run it on your own development environments if you're interested. Now, this looks rather straightforward, but when you speak into this app, a number of Google Cloud and Firebase services come together to deliver this result. First, the, the Android device captures your voice, makes a recording of it, and uploads it to a Google Cloud storage bucket. That automatically triggers a cloud function, which sends your recording to the Cloud Speech API, which extracts the words from it. And the words are then sent to Cloud Translation API, which translates it to a bunch of different languages. Those translations are then written to a Cloud Firestore database. That, in turn, triggers an event in the Firebase SDK back on the device, which is how it's able to receive the translations and display them on the screen. Now, that is a pretty good example of a modern cloud-based mobile app. Note that there are no web servers or application servers anywhere in this design. In fact, we can call it a 100% serverless app. It's really just a set of components that are most of them in the cloud and loosely connected via events. Each of these components can also scale independently, meaning there are no scalability bottlenecks in this design either. Cloud storage and Firestore can handle massive volumes of data. Cloud functions can handle massive amounts of concurrent events. And it doesn't really matter whether you have one Android device or 100,000, it'll work just the same. And to top it all, you only pay for what you use, which in this case are some storage space and some functions compute time. And if your usage is low, you will fit into the Firebase free tier, and you won't have to pay anything. So that was just a taste of what Firebase and Google Cloud can do for you. I hope that motivates you to use Firebase in your own projects. Just keep in mind that Firebase that behind the Firebase SDKs and all the products are those different feats of engineering that we talked about, like data centers, Spanner, Borg, all that. Firebase is really just a way for you to leverage that infrastructure to build amazing, world-changing apps. So as my concluding remark, I urge you to go forth and develop something awesome. My name is Hiranya, and it's been a pleasure talking to you.